Amen. Would you all pray with me? God, on this cloudy, gloomy, cold autumn Sunday, may you be with us. May your presence saturate this place, and may we know you more and more. Amen. So as I was preparing for this reflection, uh, I kept finding myself being pulled away. Some of you may know what that's like. I would literally be at my computer, I have all of my notes open, and I'm mentally prepared to write, and to write like I've never written before. And then that small voice in my head tells me, Howard, you should go for a walk. Or Howard, you haven't done the dishes yet. You should probably go do the dishes before your wife gets angry at you. Or you should prepare dinner. Or hey, maybe call your brother. It's been a while since you last talked. Some of you know what that's like, especially for those of you who are in college or grad school. You know what I'm talking about when you're supposed to be writing that paper and then you decide to do otherwise. There are some in this world that call that procrastination, and sometimes you would be correct. But in this instance, it felt a little bit more like an invitation. An invitation to be present, to take note of what is going around me, and to listen to everything that's around me. And I know that it was the Spirit's call to follow along in this song, to go to a river. And as I sat by that river, there were two things that stuck out to me. The first is the connection between weeping and remembering. When was the last time you found yourself weeping as you were remembering something? Maybe something important to you. Maybe something that you lost. For the Israelites who wrote and sang this psalm throughout the generations, especially during exile and captivity, Zion wasn't just a physical place. It was, but it was more than that. It was the amalgamation. It was the gathering. It was the pinnacle of hope, of security, of power, of what they saw as justice or the thing that would bring them justice. And it was everything that they wanted and everything that they needed. And so the songs about Zion, the ones that were passed down across the generations are often and were often ones of hope, of joy, a celebration of remembering all that God has done for you and for your people. But in this psalm, we find a different story. One of singers and musicians gathered by the rivers of Babylon, weeping and remembering. Weeping because Zion, this place, this figure, has been destroyed by Babylon, the place in the land that they find themselves. And they're remembering the ruins upon which their temple once stood. A temple that was once filled with music and the glory of God. How could they sing the Lord's song in a foreign, strange land next to unfamiliar waters? You can't. I mean, how could you? The songs that sing of God's majesty, of how God is faithful, of how God will liberate and usher in a new world. How can you sing those songs when the world around you doesn't provide any evidence? And if we were to be honest with ourselves, the reality of weeping and remembering 
isn't that far away from our reach. The destruction of Puerto Rico due to global climate change and what we're seeing in Florida and the U.S. policies that deny the island any help from ships that refuse to wave a U.S. flag. The poisoning of fresh water off the shores of Hawaii by U.S. military fuel storage facilities. The continual systematic subjugation of black folks and black life in every aspect of America and the violent scapegoating of AAPI bodies due to this nation's xenophobia. Some of us are still by that river. Some of us are still weeping. The ancient songs of Zion cannot be sung because where is Zion? The words from Zion's songs, how can they be a bomb? How can they be a salve in times of deep trouble? Now you may be finding yourself thinking or asking, where is the hope? Where is the hope in all this? And my friends, if there is a hope in this text, I believe it's found with the singers and the musicians. I believe it's found in their refusal to sing. And I believe in this psalm, there is an invitation for us to join in with the singers, with the musicians, and to cry out for a new song. In the midst of weeping and remembering Next to those poisoned rivers of Babylon, somehow and some way, those singers and musicians were able to take their weeping, take their remembering, and craft new songs. We call those songs songs of lament. This is something that black folks have bared witness to throughout the history of this nation. If you see, during chattel slavery, songs of lament were born through the spirituals, like sometimes I feel like a motherless child. During Jim Crow, songs of laments were born through jazz and blues, through beautiful songs like Strange Fruit by Billie Holiday. And during the uprising of Black Lives Matter, Songs of laments were born through hip hop, through songs like We're Gonna Be All Right by Kendrick Lamar. You see, new songs have a way of being born during difficult times because the songs of old just aren't enough anymore. Songs of laments remind us that even when we are weeping and remembering Zion by those waters, in strange lands, something will break out of our weeping. Something will break forth in our remembering. And when that something breaks out, we will find ourselves surrounded by the chorus of the great cloud of witnesses across the generations. So the real question is not about where is the hope. The real question, my friends, is will you go to the river? Will you sit for a while? Will you weep and remember? Lament's song is calling you, my dear friends, to come to the river, to sit and weep as you remember. Will you go? Amen.